Alright guys, how's it going? So today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, some of you might know, or most of you might have seen, I suppose, the video I put up recently where uh, I entered Ludum Dare. It's a 48 hour game jam. You have to make a video game in 48 hours. And I, I made like a time lapse video of uh, the game that I made, made of all the, the footage I'd recorded because I I streamed the development live on uh, Twitch TV forward slash SeanJS, which you can follow if you want to see any of my, my streamed content. I stream sort of kind of irregularly, but now and again, I do a bunch of like gaming stuff and uh, sometimes game development things as well. It's kind of a bit separate from this channel, but anyway, off topic. Uh, I, I streamed the whole thing live, I recorded a bunch of footage, and I did this time lapse video, which showed like 48 hours worth of game development squashed into. Um, about like six, what was it, like like three or four minutes or something worth of time. And uh, what I've done today is I'm actually going to sort of give some commentary on that time lapse and talk about what it was like really to take part in uh, Ludum Dare and what it was like to, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, I think it's meant to be Ludum Dare or something, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, but what it was like to take part in that game jam. And also just to kind of give an insight, I suppose, for a lot of people on the beginning, middle, and end of making a thing quickly, and the, the bare bones of it. Because that's essentially what you're doing when you enter a game jam, you just, you're just you making a complete product in a very short space of time. So everything involved in a complete product needs to essentially be there um, at a very basic level. It um, doesn't always work out that way, of course, but um, my game worked out reasonably well. Like the game itself isn't super fantastic, but it like it's it's pretty complete as far as game, you know a lot of like entries might go. Um, so yeah, I was just gonna give a bit of a walkthrough on what I did and how I did it, and sort of give an insight into how it's possible to to make a full thing and it, it, in that sort of space of time, and also just as I said to give an insight to like the beginning stages, the middle stages, and the end stages. Even though it's all compressed into the short space of time, um, I think it might be useful anyway and might give some insight. Uh, so what I've done is I've taken that time-lapse video and I've stretched it. Uh, I've like kind of doubled its length, so it's kind of slowed, slowed it down by like 50%. And uh, I'm basically just going to play it back and pause it now and again just to talk about stuff and talk about what's going on and what I'm doing. Um, before I actually play it to begin with, um, I'll just say like a bit about coming up with the idea because I didn't start streaming until about nine hours into the competition where I'd actually settled on what it was I was going to do. The theme, no one knows the theme of uh, Ludum Dare or the theme that your game has to kind of cohere to until the timer starts so that you, you, know, it's, you can't really start working until you know what the theme is, right? So... And over in the UK, the theme gets announced at basically 2am, just because of how time zones work and so on. Uh, my plan was to hear the, the theme and then go straight to bed, think on it, wake up and then, you know, think on it some more and start working. Didn't really work out that way. I heard the theme, uh, thought about it for like three hours, um, then at like 5am, I think, or maybe later than that, I think it was like 6am. I went to sleep and then got up a few hours later, um, like two, three hours worth of sleep, maybe most. And uh, and then I'd start cracking on, I, I started working, I'd pretty much settled on what I wanted to do at that point. And this was about nine hours in, I think, overall into the competition. So, yeah, first of all, a lot of time is actually just spent just thinking and planning. When you enter something like this, you don't have to just start right away. Um, I didn't really use a design document, um, a lot of people, you know, there wasn't really time for that. I'm not really the biggest fan of design documents in general. But, um, I mean, I wrote a few notes down, but it wasn't anything major, it was mostly just like so I could remember my ideas as I was going through them. And uh, it, the, the theme was a pain for me, because um, it was Connected Worlds, and uh, I just released this video game on Steam about swapping realities and these connected perspectives and connected worlds, and uh, to have to do that theme was kind of a pain when I really wanted to sort of get away from another perspective and do something totally different. Um, so that was a pain, but so it was really hard for me to come up with ideas that weren't puzzle platformers, and then the moment I did come up with an idea, because I, 
you come up with one thing, you, you realize that that thing's a little bit obvious, and you throw it away, and you come up with another thing, and so on, you just kind of keep going until you settle on something that you really think is cool and really has potential. Um, what I ended up settling on was this top-down puzzle game that still ended up having very another perspective-like mechanics, and it was, it was, it was so hard, I couldn't help it. Like, uh, like the, the theme was just too closely linked for me to end up doing something that was worlds apart from um, another perspective. But the game was very interesting, and I really didn't want to do another puzzle platform game, so it was interesting for me development-wise, to try and work on something that was top-down. I wanted to do this top-down grid-based movement stuff. I'll talk more about what the actual game ended up being as we go into it. But I'd settled on basically what a mechanic was, and I figured this I could get some cool puzzles out of this idea, maybe, and experiment with it and see where it takes me. Um, so at this point, I don't really know if what I was going to be making would be any good. and I, I still don't know if it's any good now I've finished it. Um, it, it, it's definitely interesting, and um, and yeah, it's an interesting thing to play. It's got um, this mechanic going on with it that has its pros and cons that we'll talk about more as we go on, and um, and it was worth making. Like, I didn't leap into the, the point I'm trying to make is that I didn't have this idea that I thought was golden. I was like, oh yes, this is going to be the best game ever. I had something I thought might be interesting and uh, would be an interesting challenge for me personally. Um, because it's, you know, I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying you shouldn't do stuff that you're familiar with if you're new to like development and you want to enter a game jam. I would recommend doing something you're familiar with, but I just personally wanted to challenge myself a little, so I did a different genre, I did a top-down grid-based um, which isn't particularly complex, but it was like it was mostly newish to me, so like it wasn't the same sort of things I'd done a lot of before, which was mostly platformers. So yeah, I did that anyway. I've rambled for quite a long time there, so I'm gonna start playing this now. So for some reason, the video at the start here is a bit dark, but it, it lightens up soon. I don't know if something to do with rendering. You can kind of see here. All I'm doing at this point is um. Basically, just trying to get some basic movement in. Uh, like I've thrown some sprites together. Like there's a little smiley face up there. I turn him into a little white box with an arrow later, um, and just have him sort of move around this really, really basic environment. I don't care at all at the moment what any of the art in the game looks like, and I want like my my idea originally was to focus on all the art day too. It didn't end up working out quite like that, but that was the plan going into this. So I don't care anything at all about what anything looks like. And I'm on the fly just coming up with this like system in my head for how this kind of grid-based system might work based on what I know about Game Maker and how I can make these things interact. Um, it's actually really hackily and like badly made, but like I was just kind of making sure I could get something that quickly works together. And uh, because I'm making you know a prototype here, I just I don't care too much about the code being like super clean. I'd probably care more if I had more time. But one of the nice things about having this time restriction is it forces you to kind of, you know, play to how much time you have and just worry about making things work, which is really all that's ultimately that important at the end of the day. Not that you should write bad code on purpose. But yeah, I make a lot of mistakes in the code early on, and um, like I, I do a lot of hacky things. So here as well, like I've started to just throw in some really cheap temporary backgrounds, like I just made some clouds. Um, that I uh, I made some blue clouds and I made some red clouds and I intended these to be temporary. I did not intend these to um, be in the final product. I thought I would do some much more fancy, much more pretty backgrounds, but I was just doing this for now because the idea behind the mechanic is I want to have this thing where you shift between different worlds as this one character. So like you like there might be holes and walls in one place that there aren't in another. And the way I'm accomplishing this is by building, and you can see how I've kind of marked it out with these pink lines in the room. I'm building a, a room that's like four times the size of the the viewport, and I'm just gonna shift you from one to the other like that. Just because that was the easiest way I could think of to kind of you know do this mechanic and get this mechanic across. At the moment I'm kind of working on like this idea of like. Uh, just swapping between these two worlds. I've got like a little red key over here and a red door over there. And I just, all I want at this point in time is to create a system where I can move around nicely. Um, I can swap to this world. I can pick up this key. I can swap back and go through and like finish the level. I just want that because that is 
the mechanic I'm trying to work with, and then at that point I want to start experimenting with it and just seeing what I can do with this that's interesting. Um, and a lot of those clouds that I intended to be temporary didn't actually end up uh, making it into the final game just because I didn't have time to really do any anything that was much fancier. But I I adjusted for that as kind of aesthetic, and uh, I I kind of you know I feel like it works reasonably well. It's not the prettiest game in the world, but you know it it kind of held in there. Like I made the space one as well with some stars going on because I've done that sort of thing before. Queer, very quickly there I drew a, like a little portal thing in uh, Photoshop. Really just quickly just drew some swirls in, in Photoshop. Um, I could have done the same thing in MS Paint probably, and like it just worked out. And I made that object just rotate on the spot, just like image angle plus equal one, and just twirl around. It made a perfectly valid little teleport thing that I kept all the way until the finished game. Um, again, it intended as placeholder ended up being f fair enough for the, the game. So that you can see the little arrow man I've got here. That stays that way. The player character is this little arrow in a box all the way until I've got like four hours left to go. I make the, the player character artwork somewhere in like the last four or five hours of uh, the competition. So yeah, like I've played around with like, uh, you can see me here doing some like temporary artwork. Um, just because I'm trying to get a feel for what the game will look like, even now this stuff is kind of temporary, but it was important to me for me to work out how these walls were going to tile. At the moment I'm trying to create like a little wall tiling system, um, which you've you know, seen I've done tutorials on before. Um, so I'm going to create a little simple script that will tile these walls together. And I'll, at first I approach it trying to do this sort of Zelda-like thing, like top-down Zelda, and you'll see in a minute that you see me building all these things. Um, okay, make it crashing a few times, but you can see how it like, looks here. Like this was the look I was going for, and then this was the problem. This area here was what I ran into was like, oh, if I do this style of wall, I can't really have like inner sections like this or inner, inner walls. You know, thinking back on the levels that actually exist in the game, that, I might have been able to work around that, but it would have been a restriction that would have been a pain to work with. Um, because if you think about it, if I put like a wall like this, like in this square here, it doesn't make any sense that you can then see the, this tile behind it if you know what I mean, like, and especially with these walls, if I put that one here, if I surrounded this with these kind of walls, it would seem like almost like this was a raised platform or something and not something in the middle, and like, you would want this to be black. So the only way to do it would be to stretch down and put those walls like down here and have black up there so that it still felt like it took up a whole tile. And then I would have to like make it so you could like walk behind this blackness here and like kind of make it a bit more 3D and projected than what I was going for. I wanted proper top down. Um, but I was conflicted with that idea because I knew when I wanted to do this character, which I had in my mind being this little wizard guy, I kind of wanted to do this kind of like old school RPG style of kind of like view projection, where it's like almost not proper top down and like you can kind of see more of the character. Because true top down characters, like it's it's hard to really draw them in a way that looks good. Like like I, I would I would have just drawn a wizard hat and some shoulders, really. I suppose if you think about it, top down. And it's hard to give a character like that personality, so I ended up going for, as you'll see here, like I decided that this wasn't going to work. So I create this style of wall instead. Um, and you can see going on here, which is like actually more straight, very strict top down look to it, um, with just these like bricks and then like this this blackness and space instead, using just very very simple code that just like adds up bit wise like the four directions around it and just checks how many there is and works out which object it should be based on a number between like 0 and 15 um, and yeah so this point again I think what I'm trying to do here when I'm drawing all this surface stuff and I was looking at an example there, someone I did was a brief, brief flash of it, is I'm trying to get this transition to be smooth and nice so that it like fades between the worlds, because that was very important to the feel, I didn't want it like, because it was just, at the moment I had it so like you could snap between these different worlds that I built up, but um, it like it didn't, it didn't feel very great or anything, so I wanted, it was very important to me that that transition felt good, because it was central to what the game was about. So I did this really, really hacky kind of solution I, I I don't know how bad it actually ended up being, but like it, it it worked at the end of the day. But I do this really hacky thing where you have two views, and I use one of the views to constantly be drawing the uh, screen to a surface, and then I use that surface to kind of act as a transition type thing, and and 
and sort of draw it over the screen and fade out the alpha whenever I'm shifting between worlds. It's really hacky and stores like a lot of stuff in memory. Like I'm storing the screen like constantly in memory, like every frame. But it it worked and it wasn't a huge performance killer. So you know, at the end of the day, if you're doing a jam, that's what counts. <laughs> make make your thing work. Um. So yeah, at the moment I'm still playing with that, trying to get that to work properly. And then I'm also just starting to play around with level design. So I'm building levels, seeing what would be interesting. Um trying to work out a good introduction to the game and work out like levels that um, introduce this mechanic well. Like here I play around for ages with this first level just trying to think what makes it right and what like first... I ended up getting rid of that first level and just replacing it with um, a level you might have seen a little of where it's like a bridge. Like you walk across a bridge. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to capture, catch it. You might see it at some point, I don't know. Uh, yeah, here I'm working with like uh, this level here. Uh, working with this idea that like you know you can walk to this edge and then swap and then up on this edge walk to that edge swap and the back over here and then you can walk up and so on you can kind of see so it's like meh, meh, swap to here meh, swap back to here meh, grab the key so like I had this idea, like this idea I have these four worlds but like when I started like prototyping ideas with four worlds right away it was obscenely complicated way too early so almost all of my early worlds in fact most of the levels in the game revolve around two worlds as opposed to like three or four but there are a few that handle three or four and those are some of the more interesting ones but they're just way too difficult for anyone to get a hang of it right away oh yeah so here i take a lunch break and i watch uh my friend some of my friends uh playing street Fighter four at a tournament nearby uh, i care a lot about that game and uh it's good to watch some of my friends play <laughs> but uh yeah that was just while i was eating dinner so here i make a, an interesting level that like um I don't see much of it. Like this level here was like, oh, if I can, right here we go. Yeah, this level here with like there's a big flat space and some like little squares going on here. And the idea was like um, you would have to kind of use uh, walk to the right place on here, so you'd have to remember where the key was. Walk to the right place on here, then swap back to this world, grab the key, swap back to this one, walk to the other key, swap back, grab that key and so on. And it was a cool, interesting memory game. And it was at this point I felt like I was starting to learn more about what this game wanted to be, wanted to be and what the interesting stuff about this mechanic was going to kind of be about, and it was going to be about uh, memory and remembering what was between these two worlds and how to make them interact. Because there wasn't really all that much challenge in just doing uh, the levels as they were, because you could kind of you know, scan ahead and swap, like, and just work out where you needed to be and just sort of do it. So here, yeah, I'm just doing a lot of level design tweaking, probably way more than was necessary, but this is the sort of thing that's just important to me in games, so I was doing a lot of tweaking of these levels, trying to get them to feel right. I made this one level that just flashed by there that was really, really satisfying for me, because it created this beautiful little pattern as you did it, of like horizontal lines and parallel lines intersecting, you would use that to get across the level. Here I am playing with some of the early levels trying to teach you about keys and doors. You might have noticed at some point throughout the video that uh, keys have stopped being red and blue and doors have stopped being like coloured um, and I've just gone for a more universal system where like the keys are uh, like uh, are, are white and the doors are white and it's just universal like you just need a key per door because I wanted to simplify that because I didn't want it to be too focused like the original idea for that came from like a game called Chips Challenge where you would get these different colored keys and, and go through these different colored doors but um, it ended up kind of like it wasn't an interesting part of the level design it didn't really add anything to the level design um, it could have done had I had more time I think it could have been interesting how you had to go to certain places before others um, but that for me wasn't a big deal about what the game was about. Um, here I start to introduce these blocks that you can push around um, because I thought that might be interesting to push these blocks between worlds. I wanted to have blocks that would uh, like be planar if you will and would exist like between the worlds so that when you swapped worlds the blocks would come with you and you'd be able to do interesting stuff there. Um, that I didn't end up getting that working, but I did do some cool stuff with blocks anyway. It's just important to note at this point in the game, you can swap worlds whenever you like. It was a button press. You would press the button to swap the worlds, and that was the mechanic. Um, and so I was still playing with this, and then I played with this idea that you can push blocks into um, empty space. Um, see if the level comes back. So I was building a level to kind of teach this idea as well. 
Yeah, so this level, like, you could push blocks into empty space and they would turn into platforms, so I thought that was interesting. The main thing that interested me about this block interaction was, like, this game exists already, this kind of, you know, push blocks around, you know, push them to the right place so you can progress. The number four, but I wanted to see how it was interesting with the world swap mechanic. So, like, normally here you'd be a bit stuck that you couldn't get to this square to be able to push this block to the left, but by swapping worlds you can come down into here and get into a space that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. And just stuff like that was interesting to me. So that was the sort of thing I was sort of playing with. Here I am, still doing just level design at this point. I'm not really adding too much to the game in terms of features. You saw me do a bunch of coding when I was adding these blocks. But you can see here I'm strictly just doing stuff in the editor. I'm just moving stuff around. I've got a lot of stuff already set up that I did quite early just to make platforms work, make stuff like move around properly. You can move around in the game, you could do the main mechanic. And then once I had that, I wanted to see how much I could get out of just that. How much content could I squeeze out of this like mechanic that is still interesting and not like super fillery or anything. There I am playing around with this like third world idea. I'm trying to come up with a more more complicated version of the uh, the block puzzle involving like three different worlds that you had to move between. It ended up being really hard level. Uh, here I create a level that's like completely trial and error and was horrible, and I ended up taking it out of the game. It took a lot of levels that I made out of the game. A lot more included, and then so that was around sort of when I went to sleep. Um, it's really hard to point out when it was because there was a lot of times that I ran the game, but like about uh, half, like I don't know, like a couple of hours before like that fade to black, um, which in the video would have been like I don't know thirty seconds or something like that. Um, my housemate Josh came home and uh, I had him sit down and play the game because that's a very important. It's it's one of the reasons I would probably never try and do like a progressive like progression puzzle base game um, for a jam again, because to me, playtesting them is like completely essential to the process of designing one, like, and it's not good enough to just have people play it and give you feedback, it's playtesting as in someone sits down and plays your game and you can sit behind them and watch and learn way more about their interaction with the game than, than anything they could actually tell you that they thought about the game. Um, so I was very glad that uh, my housemate came home and was willing to play the game. Um, he sat in and he played it, and uh, he got through it. Um, and, like, a lot of my early teaching stuff was very successful. Like, a lot of the level design ended up being very worthwhile, and it worked out really well, taught him the mechanics pretty pretty well, as I wanted to. Um, one problem, though, and it was a big problem, was that the game was just too easy. Like, uh, I mean, I'd spent so much time on this, like, nice difficulty curve at the beginning, the game was like super super easy and like it felt like there was almost no challenge involved in the game at all um at some points like once you'd kind of learned how it works and it became a matter of like walk to the edge of this walkway swap to the other world walk to the edge of that walkway swap world and so on and it was especially helped by the fact that you could just stand at the start and mash the swap world button and like look at everything bef before you get it all in your head and as long as you were patient enough you know you th there wasn't really much of a challenge there and uh i could tell that was it was very true like um and so at that point like a lot of those la final hours where i was playing with uh level design i was trying to think of ways to make the game more complex without making it just terrible and so like when i was making that level that i talked about which just ended up being this complete trial and error fiasco um, it wasn't good and it wasn't engaging, so like it was really distressing for me at that point that I built this thing that was too easy or too hard and never, never in the space between. Just because of how the mechanics worked, it was either like frustratingly hard to remember stuff, or um, it was like super, super easy to do things. So at this point, I kind of had this really big problem that I needed to solve. Like, how do I make how do I make this thing more engaging? And um, I was actually at this point, like, re like as I said, this was a really distressing problem because I felt like at this point I'd gone into this with this idea. I took this gamble, as I said, and I, I still think this is a good thing to do. That um, I didn't know if this idea was actually going to be any fun or not when I was making it, and I was starting to worry that maybe you know that there's no repairing this in this game. You know, it's it's not going to go anywhere or be any interesting. 
Um, I was really exhausted by this point. Like I'd had like so, like I'd had so much like sweets and junk food and stuff just sort of keeping me awake working on this thing. Not something I would super recommend, but definitely was a thing that got me through uh, <laughs> energy wise. But um, up until the point where I was just like, no, I need to get some actual good sleep. So um, I decided, you know, screw it. I'll, I'll sleep on this problem. I'll wake up, come out with fresh eyes, and uh, that actually helped a lot. So this is the first time I actually got a good amount of sleep. I got like a good like eight, nine hours of sleep. But this did leave me with like less than. I mean, I think I say in the video. I need to start working here. Less than ten hours remain. Yeah, that was basically right as I woke up after those. Like I worked long enough and then slept eight hours though after I got up I had about 10 maybe 12 like 10 12 hours left to go um but I came up with an idea and um, I think I did it in the early minutes of this as it was fading out the uh, in really early in the morning I well, I think it was early, I'm not actually sure where but it was somewhere in the second day anyway and this was a pain as well because like I had planned for the entire game to be sort of functionally complete into the second day, and that I was just going to work on artwork and presentation. That is still mostly what I ended up doing, but there was still a lot of level design stuff, a lot of levels that needed adding to the game, a lot of stuff that needed to be really worked out about what the game was meant to be. So the prob the solution to the problem that I came up with, and whether or not it, it really worked, I don't know, um, but it definitely changed things up and it definitely made the game feel very different, and I'm glad I came up with this was to make the uh, the world swapping time-based. So every 20 seconds or so, the world would just swap between the worlds, and you wouldn't have control over it anymore. You wouldn't have that same sense of agency where you could stand in a safe spot. Because I'd always designed the levels so that you were always safe at the beginning. Um, like, if you... Like, if th there was no way for you to move to a spot uh, from the beginning of where you spawn in a level to somewhere where if you then swapped you would fall right away without having had that information first. So you always sort of start off on like a small limited platform or something like that and then you would be able to swap and then see ahead of what changes so like you, you actually have access to all the information. And uh, that actually worked out really well when I decided to make this change and make it so that you had no control over the, the swapping and the swapping would just happen with or without you. Um, and then the game became much more focused around these interesting like memory challenges and the stuff I was talking about earlier that was um, interesting. So now that I had this like fundamentally sort of changed system, um, this obviously had a big knock-on effect to my level design, and uh, it completely altered away some of the block levels work. But I'll talk about that a little bit later. So here, after making this sort of big change to the level, I need to. Uh, I'm starting to do what day two was meant to be about, which is work on presentation, and I decided to build like the, like a menu screen to the game, and I decided what would both be very efficient and uh, very um, fitting for the game and effective would be to build the game menu as essentially a game level that would sort of teach you about this whole um, world swapping mechanic in the menu itself. And uh, because like my menu doesn't really need to do much, it only needs to allow you to start the game and leave the game. So I could I figured I could just have two portals that would exist on the screen that would let you like move out of the level um, and into the game, or allow you to quit the game, and then that would be it. And that's all I would need from this. So I build this sort of level based you know use some alpha like alpha mask text, so you can see the sort of the background in it to create this sort of nice effect with the text. And then sort of I build this little level in, so sort of like I build the start text and quit text here that you can like move towards and like activates those so you can tell what's going on. You see I build like the four worlds going in. Oh and at this point this is interesting. So what I decided to do now that I had this time based thing, you can kind of, you can kind of see it going on here. Um now that I have this time based thing, it was kinda of like players need to know when the world is actually gonna swap. Because like it just it was just just seemingly happening at random. And I wanted to be able to like change the timings between levels and stuff, um, and that would really throw a lot of people off if no one had any feedback or clue as to when this thing was happening. So I needed something like a timer or something on the screen that would show you when the world is going to swap. What I ended up settling on was building like a particle system that shot like these little particle beams around the edge of the screen, and whenever these beams hit a corner, uh, that's when the world would swap, and the the colors of the particles would match the color of whatever the world you were in at the time. 
Um, originally, I wanted to the, the co all the world to be like super themed around something like a, like a fire world or like a like a sky world and all that kind of stuff. Um, I ended up just settling for basically just different variants of this render cloud in the background. Like I had the spacey one, the sky one, the sort of lavery looking one, and the floor and stuff all stays the same. But that was just a, a matter of lack of time. But I think you know I did a reasonably good job of conveying what I wanted to. So these particle effects, and once I'd done these, I thought these were nice because they were like, they weren't too distracting. They were a little distracting, I think, but they weren't too bad, and um, they have this nice peripheral quality about them, and they're not really taking any, like, focus away from the game. They're just there, and it was very easy for people to just sort of notice, like, donk, 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 when this was happening. And especially the fact that I had it happening in the menu made it easier. So here I was playing around, well, briefly there I was playing around with a mechanic that I didn't end up putting in the game. And here I'm just going through the levels and building more content now. Now that I'm happy with how this mechanic works, or happy-ish, uh, I just want to exploit it. Oh, so here is now where uh, uh, I actually decide to add the character. Now that I've, you know, I've done a bunch of levels and stuff, um, it's important for me at this point. Now I've got, like, probably at this point less than, like, five hours to go. Um, I don't want to end the game just having all these arrowed, blo uh, arrowed uh, blocks that represent the player and moving around, so I want to create this little wizard. Um, even though I have like a pure top-down aesthetic for the rest of the game, um, I still just really didn't want to do a pure top-down character. So even though he looks sort of out of place in this world that's like otherwise like completely top-down by having this like sort of like three-quarters or side-on like projection, um, I think it works out okay, and I think he looks okay in this, in this little world that he's in. Oh yeah, I use my amazing pixel art skills here to throw together a really simple, like, three three or four frames of animation um, for, like, up, down, and right, and then I just flip the right one to get left, and, you know, all the standard smoke and mirrors. Change up the artwork of the doors a little bit, they don't, they don't really look great by the end, but, you know, they... They look more fitting than the, the placeholder ones I had, changed the keys around a little bit as well. And then at this point, um, I decided to actually put some music into the game, and I, like, basically retrofit some music that I'd made for something else. I took the same sort of instruments that I sort of already had configured, and um, basically just produced some new sounds with them. What I produced was very rough and very simple. Um, spent ages playing with, like, a bass line, but ended up just settling for doing... Um, like, instead of actually having like a quick repeating bass, just having this long doom, 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 with like a little melody that plays over the top, but most of the presence of the music is just taken up by this boom, boom, boom. And this had a really nice effect as it fitted in really well with the world swapping, this like periodic time, like every now and again. So it's like world one, world two, world three, world four, and it would actually sync up like that. Um, uh, a little bit in the game, and I tried a tried hard to get it to sync up wherever I could, but because like you know you could die, and um, because uh, and when you changed rooms and stuff, and the music would keep going and wouldn't reset, there was no way to really actually keep it in sync, which was a shame. But because I think that that could have really added to it, but I do, I do think that sort of dong 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 kind of fitted with it reasonably well. Um, and you know, for for the time I had, was sort of the best thing I could really do. Yeah, I spent ages here just sort of playing around with different tunes, not really liking any of them, then I settle on this, this little bass line. Oh, and there, like, this program, let me scoot back a little bit here, because this program here, that, uh, you know, <laughs> and has game maker help in the background, teaching me how, just, uh, reminding me how audio underscore play underscore sound works, I still use F1 all the time, just to remind me how stuff works. Super useful, everyone needs to use it more. But this program here, SFXR, I didn't know existed. There's even a browser variant of this now that I, just, I didn't know existed until someone pointed it out to me after the fact. But um, it's even like got LD48 written in the corner, like Ludum Diary, 48 hours. But uh, it's this really awesome program someone put together to like randomly generate sound effects, and you can make these cool little 8-bit sound effects for like picking up items, lasers, explosions, um, power-ups, like jumping and stuff. And it would randomly generate them, and you could change all these like cool little settings and stuff. And so you could create completely unique sounds for your project that you could use because like you know, it's not being used from any other project. It's, it's brand new, brand new work. Um. Like you, could, you can use them because there's no copyright attached to any anything this generates, uh, and it's really awesome. There's some, some of the sounds you can do with this are really, really cool. Really simple, simple, cool stuff, but it's really useful creating some nice sound effects for your game. 
So I use this just to create some simple sound effects like opening the door, uh, going through the portal, um, picking up keys, and you know all that kind of basic stuff that you know would be helped by sound effects. I didn't overdo it. I don't, I don't want to put too many sound effects in the game or anything like that just for the sake of it. I put the ones in that I thought would actually enhance the experience. Like it was like it was important to know when you'd picked up a key, so I wanted a sound effect there. Um, and like and I have something to punctuate finishing the level, so I had a little uh, noise play when you go through the portal and so on. So I do some sound effects. Um, I wanted some better feedback for uh, keys when you picked up keys to show you how many you were holding at any point in time. Because through a lot of the development, I just had a big number drawn in the top left of the game that just said like one or two or whatever, and I wanted to do something way more fancy, um, like show little key icons or whatever. But I was low on time, so all I did was really extend that to just say keys held in a sort of like neat little font and just show the number afterwards. <laughs> it didn't really get any more complicated than that. So here I am just really sort of playing through, making sure what I have is finished, and that's where I build the ending to the game. You can see there the, the, the level I built with the, like the end written into it. Because again, I figured I'd kept this theme so far of building everything inside the game and not really doing any cutscenes or anything like that, because it's just it's too much for, for no gain, right? Like, I didn't want to spend ages doing like a massive cutscene or anything like that. There's, there's no point. Um, and like, I had no real like, narrative built into the game, I'd spent all my time on gameplay and level design. Um, there's, a, there's kind of this implied story, I guess, about this wizard who's like, oh, lost in space and time and has this magic power. Uh, but, um, but really, it was just, you know, it was just a game about, it was a game for game's sake. And uh, the ending, I figured, you know, it would be fitting to have the ending to the game be a level in the game, just as the menu in the game is also a level in the game. So I built this level that just says the end, and then jokingly down here also, like, you can just sit make out here, it says, like, the, and then it, it swaps the world that says end, swaps the world that says question mark at the end, and then the last world would actually have the portal that would allow you to finish the world. So you would see it in sequence because the world would be swapping, like, dum, dum, dum. So you would you would you would see it in that order. The end question mark walk through the portal, and then I would just have it when you walk through that portal, the game would actually close, and that's that's as simple as I kept it kept it bare basics because it's what it's what I had time for. Man, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I was testing some stuff, and then I was rendering it. Then that that here is just the stuff I was showing on my stream. Where it says, oh, there should probably be game off video footage there. That's just because I had the the video footage on my desktop um, muted or like blanked out while I was. Um, or disabled while I was uploading my game to like my FTP account because obviously I need to type in usernames and passwords and stuff and I just don't want people being able to see that stuff and then I just enter it all in there and then I turn the stream off and then like this from my time lapse is just some footage of my game I'll, I'll start it playing but it's playing in like slow slow motion but you can kind of see what I ended up with um, this is obviously playback at half speed. You can see this menu here that like teaches you a little bit about the game before you even start playing it, and how these particle effects are going to go around and the world's going to change. You come through into the portal into the game. This is what ended up being the first level of the game, and one of my favorite ones, just for demonstrating the mechanic, because this one's to here, and you can see, oh, suddenly there's a bridge. And I liked how it started in the place where you, you do had no access at all, but you could see this thing here, and if you remembered that, you'd be able to walk across to your finish there. And this level here, where um, you, know, you can see there's the key down there, so you can move across to the end of that platform, swap back, move over there, and get the key. And that's basically it. So um, the only other thing I didn't really get I suppose, to talk too much about was the things like uh, the blocks that ended up, uh, the, the pushing around blocks. That was changed massively when I decided to change the system of like automatic uh, world swapping instead of like player pressing a button to swap the worlds. Because like some of the levels have involved a lot of pushing blocks like a long way, and that really sucked with the system. Because like you would be pushing a block, pushing a block, and then the world would swap, and you would you wouldn't have anything you wanted to do in the other world. You would just want to get back to the other world so you could keep pushing the blocks. So you would just push, 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 wait, push, 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 wait, and it was, it was a lot of just waiting and boring stuff. So a lot of those levels ended up getting cut, either cut out or changed dramatically so that they would. Uh, they would fit better with this new system, which meant I didn't get to explore the block stuff as much as I would have liked. I didn't get to explore anything as much as I would have liked. I only had 48 hours, but the whole experience was generally really, really fun, um, and that's how I made a complete game in 48 hours. It wasn't the best game ever made. It wasn't uh, 
by any means, but at the same time it was something that was complete and made, you know, it had a menu, it had a beginning, it had a middle, and it had an end. And it had an interesting mechanic, and anyone who was able to bake, uh, make something and finish it in that time, you know, my, my hat is off to you, because it was very difficult for me to do so. It's, it's, it's not, not an easy thing. <laughs> not an easy thing to do. But that but that said, I'm just contradicting myself in circles now, but that said, it's easier than you'd think. Like I say, I've just talked about how I did it, and uh, hopefully that gives you some sort of insight as to uh, what it's like to try and build something in this sort of short space of time. And uh, also just, you know, an overview of generally everything that goes into building a game in general. Um... I'm going to say some of the things I didn't get time to do would make new fancy artwork for this, uh, these tiles, uh, make new fancy artwork. <laughs> a lot of the stuff I didn't get time to do was new fancy artwork, but I decided that was one of the least important things about the game. And again, like hopefully this gives you some insight as to what is important to get done, and what is important to show off, and what is important to learn and to try and practice above all other things. Um, especially if you're doing game jams, but just if you're doing games full stop and you want to make things and finish them and get better at making them, is learn how to focus your time well and decide what it is that's important for you to finish and, uh, and, and what is less important and what you can what you can cut away. A lot of times on like game projects that are not uh, game jam stuff, that are like actual Full length projects, the um, the hardest decisions, and then sometimes the very best decisions you will make will be about what to remove from your game, what features to not add to the game, what you don't want to put in the game, um, because those the, the decisions you make there and the, the features that you don't add, because you know we could all go on forever just adding stuff to our game to make them better and better and better, but um, the decisions you make about what you don't have time for, the decisions you make about what you do want to do are what's going to come across in your game as important to you. So that's the important thing about all of this, maybe. I don't know, I'm just talking nonsense at this point. But I hope that that was somehow useful for all of you, and uh, I hope some of you will enter Ludum Dare or other game jams in future. And I will catch you guys next time. See you guys.